Welcome to Hacking Bar Games, Part 2. Welcome to the second part of Hacking Bar Games. In the first part, we showed you how to get a root um, shell on the Megatouch system, and we showed you how to find out how the game starts and extract the game binaries. In this part, we're going to talk about reverse engineering the actual binary once we have it, and then patching it to defeat the security key. This part will be a little more technical, a lot more technical. Um, we're going to be using a program, a program called Ida Pro, and we may uh, use hex rays. I think I have some hex ray slides in here. Both of them are phenomenal programs um, made by the same company, um, hex, I think it's hex rays. Yeah, hexrays.com, www.hexrays.com. And um, the software is fairly expensive, but um, Ida Pro is amazing, and if you're into arcade hacking, you can get the um, starter version of Ida, which will do all the old arcade. Uh, 80s arcade stuff and I'll do 32-bit Intel stuff and that's all you need for for example the Mega Touch or old arcade games which I like to hack and once you buy it um, it is you can use it forever you don't get upgrades you get support for a year unless you pay and the, the, the renewal fee is actually fairly small definitely worth it if you like this kind of stuff um, but you can use it forever even after if you decide not to renew the support on it anyway let's get to work so how to uh, figure out how to beat the security key. So um, the first thing I do is take the key out and you see these messages. These are the messages that we got. Um, when there's no key in there, it says no security key detected, machine will reboot attempt to one of five, an invalid key, machine will reboot attempt, and then in this case, two of five. And um, one of the easiest ways to find out um, and, and find the thing you want to bypass is to follow back, get the code, and follow back the um, the strings. These are the strings, the, the messages that they give, and find out where in the code those messages are referenced. And you're usually your failure of whatever is stopping you. The key in this case will be right around the same place. However, um, the guys who developed this were a little bit tricky. Um, I was thrown for a loop when I went in and tried to find, I used grep strings, I'm sorry, to um, to look through the system, and then I used Ida's strings view, um, and none of these phrases were in the binary, and I thought that was be really weird, and for a while I thought maybe I'm looking at the wrong binary, maybe this is just another binary that starts something off and then um, other things are loaded in, or maybe it's a shared library that's doing the checking and, and it had me a little confused for a bit. Um, in the end though it ends up that these strings were not actually stored in the binary like this. They were they were hidden. They were in the binary but they were actually um, encrypted or obfuscate, ob, there I can't say that word, obfuscated um, so that they never appeared so you couldn't do that little trick. So that was kind of neat, a little neat um, protection that the developers did. Um, but we'll talk about that later and how we how they were all uh, encrypted or obfuscated. Okay. So um, actually, let's go back real quick and show you that they weren't in there. So got Ida here. Um, opened up the decrypted start binary. If I go to View, Open Subviews, Strings, it shows me a list of um, things that it thinks are strings. And you can use uh, Control F to try to search through. And um, let's type range. And you see um, there is nothing that has any of those, those range um, strings that we we're looking for. I'm sorry, I was looking for invalid key or security key detected. Let's go back and look for that. So let's look for, not range, but let's look for key. Let's do it valid. And there's a lot of things about category, invalid, you know, uh, money shoot hooper type, whatever. But um, there's no invalid key in here anywhere. Let me search for key and see if we can find key. There's, there's not a lot of things that have, actually there's a lot of key, uh, here, things in here that have key, but no invalid key. Um, so, 
that was you know that's interesting because usually um, you can quickly look for you know if you have a see a message you can quickly go backwards find let's say for example um, player key corrupts see I saw this message which is in here I click on that and uh, do what's called a uh, cross reference and find cross references to where that that um, is found or in the code and you can see here player key corrupt so you usually qu very quickly can find something like that and then you know work your way somewhere around here is is probably going to be the code that triggered the event um, that you're looking for but in this case it was not so we had to look elsewhere so what do we do well um, the code is C++ and C++ generally embeds very useful names into functions um, that give you a lot of data about what's going on. Um, and since the code was C++, we had a lot of really useful function names. Actually, let's look at some of those function names again. In Ida here, we can see all kinds of functions on the left. Um, let's look for key manager, which is going to be one that we look, use a lot. And you can see there's a lot of things about key manager check some version is 1995 Dallas key, so forth and so on. Let's do uh, security and see if we find anything. Look at this, USB I.O. security key detected. And then we have some code there. Um, so because it was C++, it gave us a lot of useful information about that. Um, And you know a lot of useful function names, and that that themselves give a lot of information about what what they might be doing. Um, but there's a lot of them, as you can see. Look at all these functions, tons of functions. So um, anyway, anyway, um, so the first one that's that jumped out at me is USB I/O security key detected, and I thought to myself, oh, can it be that easy? Um, based on the other stuff that we did in the first um, part. I thought maybe it is, maybe uh, it's just simply that easy that we just make this function always say yes, security key is detected. But it wasn't that easy. Um, so I did make the USB I.O. security key detected always return true. And now what happened is the game thinks there's a key in there but doesn't understand the key and it can't actually read the data off the key. So if I remember correctly, the message I got was um, invalid key, a machine will reboot when I did that. Okay. So that didn't that didn't work out as well as I liked, but um, so I thought, all right, well we got a little more of a challenge. So I continued reversing and um, started call, tracing the call flow graph at main, and it went something like this: system init, which calls system init. I'm sorry, not system, but init vars, which calls key manager get instance, key manager confirm key, and a whole bunch of other key manager stuff. And this key manager class looks interesting. Um, looks very useful. There's a lot of calls to it, a lot of functions. So almost all of these key manager methods are what we call getters, um, accessor, accessor methods. They simply return a value. So let's look at, let's look at these key manager functions. And for example, get instance. That's a bad example. That's not the one I want. How about this one? Is, 99, is 1995 Dallas key? Very simply, um, very, very simple. It just returns basically a, um, a field out of a data structure, okay? Checksum, again, returns just a field out of a data structure. In this case, it's returning um, 982 hex, um, a word at 982 hex into EAX, which is the, the pointer to the key manager class. Version, same thing, almost all these are very simple accessor methods. Okay, you can see I, as I go through it, just very simple accessor methods. So I started off just hooking these and giving them back information that I wanted them to respond at, regardless of whether they're the key in or not. But there's like 55 of these, and that got annoying. Um, I decided after about three or four that I'm not doing it this way. There's got to be a better way, and certainly there was. So. Um, Started doing that method, then said, ask, ah, screw it, started again. And um, rather than overriding them, I, I took a different approach. Um, 
I went and looked at the key manager class sum, and if you know anything about C++, which I don't know much about C++, I hate C++, it's a horrible language in my opinion. I'm a big fan of C, not a big fan of C++, but then again, I'm not, an, I'm not a software engineer, and I'm not an app developer, I like low-level um, low level systems code and, and systems glue, so I like things that are um, that systems use, not that people use, and the very simple, straightforward C. Um, C language is a beautiful thing. Um, <clears throat> but I don't like C++, I'll be honest. Um, anyway, um, but in C++, when you initialize a class, or when you initialize an, what's called an instance of the class, it runs this initialization function called init. And no, it doesn't. What am I talking about? It, call, it runs an initialization function, which is the name of the class. Yeah, okay, I lose. Um, but this method had, if we went back and looked at it, it had a function called init, which was called from the beginning, the moment you um, basically initialize a key manager class. Um, and the constructor for the, uh, I'm sorry, the um, not the constructor, this is not the constructor, and that's my bad, now that I think about it. The constructor, or the, the init method, not the constructor, it's not a constructor, for the key manager class, one of the first things it does is call this uh, method key manager read. Then from key manager read, it copies much of the data that is read into the key manager um, uh, class class memory area. Um, basically, it's filling out the instance values um, of that that. Um, that, that key manager class, the, the actual um, class member values. And um, one of the things I noticed, it's a, it's a very shallow class. It doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't have really any, if I remember correctly, external pointers to external data. It's basically a very flat class and it just has a bunch of data that it reads from the key and gets populated into from the key into the class structure. So it, it made sense to focus on this method because all the data is coming in to this class. Um, it's getting, it's populating those member, those uh, those uh, class member fields, and um, which the the uh, things like key manager version and key manager is 1995 DS key um, actually access and, and give you the results of. So it makes sense to focus on this method. So as I mentioned, the first call in key manager init is something called key manager read, or one of the first calls. And uh, key manager read, one of the, the first things it does is determine what type of key is inserted. Because um, there's different keys that the various mega touch units, uh, force units used. And each of the keys is slightly different. In, in, in the 2011 version, it wanted a, a DS1995 key, but there are other keys um, from the previous versions of the earlier version of the Mega Touch, and they, they, they seemed the code base seemed to be fairly similar. It, it, they didn't, even though the 19, I'm sorry, the 2011 only used the 1995 key, um, it still had code to deal with some of the keys from the old versions. So it determines what key is, in, is, is inserted, and it calls a USB I/O, which is another um, class method to read from that family of keys. In our case, it calls USB I/O read DS. 1995 key data does some processing on that data and and then returns it okay um, one of the interesting thing is this 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 function has what's called side effects it, it um, yeah Google side effects I, I, I don't want to go into what a side effect is it's not really important um, but it, it has side effects and that is important because it, it's not a very the, the interface is not hundred percent clean it does things outside of the, the nice clean C++ interface, um, which caused issues later on. Anyway, tried to hook that function um, and just return the data that I wanted to. On, um, but I found that I needed to go deeper. So instead of just hooking key manager read, I had to um, go and hook this USB IO read DS one 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 nine five key data function, okay, and uh, the USB I/O read DS one one nine five key data 
um, reads the encrypted data off the key, reads a serial number, and then uses the serial number, of, well, a function of the serial number, it takes a serial number and some other data, does some mashing around of the data to create an encryption key, and then decrypts the key data. Okay? Um, but what I need is the original encrypted data to make this really smooth and really clean because I'm going to hook this at the lowest level and rather than try to deal with the unencrypted data which because of the side effects I don't actually want the unencrypted data I want the real encrypted data it's going to be a lot cleaner and easier if I just have the real encrypted data and I um, kind of replace or hook this DS1195 key data to return the encrypted data and let the rest of the system work as it expects on encrypted data. Okay. Luckily, the developers were nice enough to leave me something called GDB, which is a debugger. Um, it's on the system, and um, I don't know why it's there, but thank you for that, because not that it's a problem. It's not there. I can always install it, but it, it just made life really super simple. Okay. So thanks for that, developers. Okay. And a GDB is a debugger, which lets you go into a running program, manipulate it, read its memory, do all kinds of, you can rewrite the code in GDB, which I found was really useful um, to rewrite the code on the fly rather than taking the code, coming back to my workstation, going to IDA, patching the code with IDA or Hex Workshop, putting it back into the system and trying. Um, I just used GDB to quickly um, prototype the changes I wanted by directly altering the system memory on um, the code. That was running, but um, so what I did to defeat DS um, this USB IO read DS one one nine five key data is um, a breakpoint into the USB IO read uh, DS one one nine five key data, and what it does is it actually does a low level. Th this function goes low level into the um, the USB hardware, if you will, and reads data from the USB I.O. hardware. And so what I did is put the valid key in the system, because I have one, right, because I have a legal copy of this. And um, and immediately after it read the, read the data from um, that function call, I uh, simply just stole the data, right? Um, it was, and then that was real easy. So. Uh, let it read the data from the system, breakpoint, stop the code, and then read the memory that it just read. Okay. And then later on, what I did when I want to run it without a key in the system is I simply, rather than having it read the key from that USB hardware, um, I stored the file on the hard drive and had it read from the file instead. And um, that way, it's, it's nice because I don't have to worry about the decryption process at all um, because I'm hooking it so low level, I'm just replacing where the, the encrypted data is coming from um, from the key to a file on disk. And it was real sup super simple and clean. So here's what it looks like. This is generally, um, this is the call USB IO read memory that actually um, accesses the real key data and um, reads it off the key. So this is what the call looked like before. After it detects that there's a security key, it um, reads um, basically about 1K of data in 128 byte chunks from the um, from the key and stores it in memory. So this is what it looked before. This is hex race. Um, and basically, this is what it looks like after I patched it. Rather than all that other stuff, I just say rekey data from disk, um, which is some code that I wrote. And I, I hand assembled it and put it in the binary. And then I had it to, to call that code instead. So. This is the assembly for that. So what I do here, I'll walk you through it, is um, first of all, I store in where I'm going to keep the key data, temp.key. Um, so I wrote that, that data that I read out of memory when the system read the data from the key, and I just stored it in that file. Um, I use GDB to do that. Um, push A just simply pushes all the registers to the stack. XOR, EAX, EAX, and ATMU, um, X or anything by itself at zero, so I just this means set EAX to zero basically. Then I move the low um, low byte of EAX. Um, I put five in there, so now EAX is equal to five, which is a system call um, number. So it's Linux sys open. Then I move the um, 
code, or I'm sorry, not the code, this, the location of where the key is stored into the EBX register. Then I set um, ECX um, to zero with the XOR, and then I did a system call. Why did I do a system call? Because it's easier. I could have done a libc call, um, which is what probably most people do, but it's actually harder to do that because I have to figure out an offset to the um, where um, to, to, to basically it's my global offset table. And I had to push things onto the stack, and it's just easier to write things right to, to registers and call the list of, uh, this Linux system calls. So anyway, um, what that happens is ex is the system call number, which is five for open. Um, temp key is the um, in ebx is the second parameter to, or the first parameter open, which is the location, and ecx is just the flags um, or the mode, how you want to open it, which is zero, which is just open it. I think it means read. I don't remember. Zero is read only. It might be read right. I don't remember. Point is, it, it, that's what I wanted. Okay, so we did a open. Then we move uh, the return value, which is a file handle, uh, just an integer basically, and ex. Move that to ebx because we're going to need that in the next call. Uh, changed ex from five to three. Loaded in a pointer to the memory that we want to read, or we want to store the data that we're reading. Put in the um, number of bytes we want to read into edx which is about a, a 1k and then do a system call in 80. Um, system call 3 on Linux is read um, so we read ex is um, I'm sorry ebx is what we want to read which is the file handle 3 ecx is the next um, parameter to read which is the location that we want to write the data to and the third argument is how much data to read then we'd move uh, AL, make that 6. EBX was already the file handle. And then we do in 80, which does the Linux um, call, the system call close on EBX, which was the file handle number, and it's closed. So we open the key, read the key data, and close the key. I'm sorry, yeah, close the key, file. Okay. And then we um, pop our uh, variables back from the stack and return. Okay. Very cool. So, how are we done? Think so? No. Um, that wasn't enough. Okay. Um, because the data on the key is encrypted using the serial key number, just replacing that encrypted data and, and, and allowing the system to access it is not enough because now that the key is no longer in the drive, it doesn't know the serial number. So it can't actually decrypt the data. So we have to actually provide the correct key serial number into the system so that the USB IO read DS1195 key data can decrypt it correctly. Um, unfortunately, we cannot just override key manager serial number, which is the, the accessor method to getting the serial number because um, of those side effects that I mentioned happen. Um, so you can get the serial number by using um, key manager serial number, but the USB IO read DS1195 key data actually pulls a serial number from a global variable that gets populated from another function. So um, couldn't just override key manager serial number. Instead, I had to override USB IO read key ID, which populates that global variable. Okay. This is what USB IO read key ID looked like before. Um, I, if I remember correctly, this checks to make sure there a read happened or the, the key is physically inserted, I don't remember. And normally it goes, if a key's in, it goes to the left path. And it actually reads a serial number and then actually XORs the, the of every byte XORs the uh, most significant byte. I don't know why I did that, but it does. Because the key number that it is returned from the system is actually not the serial, I'm sorry, the serial number is actually not the serial number. It's the serial number with every um, high bit um, X order with, with one. So I don't know whether I'm missing something or that was another little trick that the developers did to try to stop people from hacking the system. Um, you can't just, the serial number can't just, you can't just read it directly. You have to then do this XOR operation on it. So, so what I did is, um, and then it goes on this path. And if the key is not inserted, you see here, it fills in a bogus serial number. Um, well, A5, 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 A5. So what I did, is because we know we're not going to actually physically have a key present, I change this instruction so it ends up always going this way. So because the key is not in there, it's going to jump zero. Um, 
which is true. The key is not present. I'm just going to go there, and then we just fill in the key number manually. Okay? That was easy. So, all right, so we've, we've encrypted, we changed the, um, we've dumped the key data, the encrypted key data, and we've altered it so that it reads the data from disk rather than the key. And then we um, manually set the key, the key serial number in memory. We got to be done, right? We're done for sure. No. Unfortunately, there's another function called key manager confirm key. And key manager confirm key validates the key and produces error messages if not. It checks to make sure the key is physically inserted and that the serial number is in the right range, I think, and that it's the right family of key, that it's the key used on the Force 2011 and not one of the earlier versions. It does a bunch of checks. Um, and if not, boom, it gives you an error. So this is what the, what's called the call flow graph looks like. This is an, uh, like a flow chart of what confirm key does. But one of the first things confirm D, D does is actually right down here in this first what's called a basic block. One of the last things it does in this basic block is make a call to key manager check. And if key manager check returns the right value, it goes all the way to the end and is happy. If it returns a value that's not the one that it wants, it goes down to here. And these actually different things print different error messages on the screen. So um, we've got to look at what key manager check does. This is what key manager check does. This is a call flow graph of key manager check. See, it's, it's a, lot, a little bit more simple, but it's still pretty complex. Does some stuff and then makes some decisions and, and returns a value. Um, basically, it says, is the key inserted? What is the family ID of the key? Is it the right for the 2000 force, 2011 force? Is a serial number in a certain range? Um, I think that check was in there. Serial number uh, range check. I'm almost positive, but I could, it might have been somewhere else, but maybe not. Who knows? It's been a while since I did this. Um, and um, based on the, you know, all the checks, it returns a value. Well, I know what value I want it to return. I don't want to do all these checks. So this is what the key manager check looked like before we altered it. This is what it looks like after we altered it. Basically, we just say return true or return one. So what I do is our XOR EAX, which is going to be the return value. So it's zero. But I don't want it to return 0. I want it to return 1. So then I increment EAX and return that. So we went from this code to this code. And uh, that's great. And in the process, you can see that this thing here is a lot of code. Um, we f freed up a lot of bytes that are no longer needed. And um, remember how I told you I patched some of the code earlier to, 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 to get the key from the hard drive? I wrote some of that, that custom code myself. Um, and I put it somewhere, well, what I did is all the, the, the free bytes I freed up by making this so short, right? Um, I just put the code in the bytes that were freed up. So that gave me space. So now are we done? Yeah, we're done. That, that did it. So those three things, um, changing the um, system to read from the physical key, I'm sorry, from the hard drive rather than physical key, inserting the serial number hard-coded into the, the binary, and then um, fixing key manager check so it just returns one and doesn't do all this junk. That fixed the problem for us. We are now done. The system is hacked, and it works. Okay, So that was our, our outline. Um, the first method, first part, we showed you how to get root shell. Um, we showed you how to obtain that um, game binary, and then um, we talked about reverse engineering the patch and defeating the security key. Here's an example of it running without the security key. And, and you notice if you're playing close attention, this isn't um, my mega touch, this is running on a PC. Um, because I took the mega to, to work on it, I took the mega touch guts out. It's just a normal PC and put in a regular PC case and hooked it to a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse just because it was easier to just access everything. But um, that's what it looks like. Okay. But this is the actual motherboard with the IO card, it's just physically in a different case that's more accessible. So there was actually some other interesting things in this um, experiment um, that I did, that I found, random weirdness. Um, when searching through the strings of the uh, main game binary, dstart, I found this, the cow goes black. And that confused me for the longest time, even after I actually hacked everything. I'm like, what the heck is this cow goes black? There's got to be... That's, that's got to be something interesting. And it ends up being that um, 
remember I mentioned that the, the error messages were actually encrypted and at runtime, um, the data, the error messages were actually decrypted. So um, in the system binary, you never saw the, you know, invalid serial number or invalid key, whatever it was. Um, you saw they weren't there. Um, it's because they were encrypted with this phrase. The cow goes black. So there was a uh, weird, what I call a weird obfuscation routine, uh, UMMS. And basically, um, you would feed it a encrypted string. You would feed it the key. In this case, the car goes black and, um, and a length and a destination. It would decrypt it. And those were the error messages in most cases. In some cases, they were paths to important files that they, you know, they didn't want people obviously finding by doing strings on the file because um, strings will give you a lot of information. You don't have to have IDA to get strings. You can just literally run on Unix, like Linux, the program strings, and it will show you all the, the strings that it can find. Um, there was also another key that I saw that was used, um, YXZ, wait, WXYZ1234. Um, basically, what the algorithm does is it XORed each character in the original encrypted string with um, one of the characters in the key and you know, just went through them, and then once it hit, once the key was done, it would start over. And um, so this was used to hide paths as well as key fail failure error messages. And that was kind of neat. And as I mentioned, there were some other weird tricks. Um, uh, the C++ accessors I mentioned were usually used to access the data, but in some cases, the, uh, there were some functions rather than using the accessors. Um, would reach into global memory. I'm not sure if they did, the developers did that on purpose, again, to make things harder for you to, to kind of reverse engineer and hack or, or, or not, who knows. Um, so those side effects were interesting and those global values or values stored both in accessor methods and global variables were, were, were interesting. And, um, and the key, USB read key ID, remember when I mentioned that the serial number that is returned by the low level um, um, hardware is wrong. It's um, the high bit of each byte um, is XORed with one. So um, I can only think that has to be another just kind of method of, of, of protecting people from hacking it. Um, but there you go. So I learned a few lessons from this whole experience. Um, Software engineers should not try to roll their own software security or copy protection. Let software engineers do what they're good at, which is write awesome games in this case. Again, um, I, I mean, no disrespect to any of the, the um, developers at Merit who have made like, an amazing system. Um, developers should do what they're good at, which is write awesome games or code or whatever, they, and they did that um, 100%. Um, and I, it's sad, uh, I'm kind of sad that they had to do that. They had to write their own, you know, whatever reason they had to, write their own security protection um, um, rather than focusing on the game because they made awesome games. And um, again, I don't mean to discredit them for that, that they did a great job, made great games. And they did actually some interesting tw tricks to try to trick us. But the thing is, security is hard. It really is. Um, so leave security to security, uh, validated security methods. Um, <laughs> But the next lesson is it's really hard to copy protect anything um, because, again, you have physical access. It's really difficult. Even with the encryption they did, um, when you do encryption, you, you generally, in most cases, you're going to have some type of um, what's called symmetric key encryption. And if you use symmetric key encryption, you have to have the key somewhere. And if someone who's reverse engineering your software can usually find the key, and which is which we did in all these cases. Um, so it's, it's really hard to copy protect things. Um, one thing I did learn that GDB is really nice on the fly to patch things. When I started out, I started out taking, putting a USB stick in the, the Mega Touch, dumping the DIN code, bringing it back to my workstation, patching it by hand, copying it, writing it to USB, going back to the original Mega Touch, putting it back in, reloading. That was a long and painful process. And then I realized, wait, GDB. Why am I patching? Why am I taking the system and patching and doing this, this long, complex process when I can just you know, patch a memory on the fly with GDB? So I made my changes just in GDB in a quick script, um, loaded the patches I wanted. If they didn't work, I would change them around a little bit and, um, and go. And um, that was awesome. So I never used 
I mean, I've done that before, but I've never really thought of using GDB to prototype or patch code and, and check changes on the fly, which was kind of fun. So I learned something from that. Big lesson I learned, don't take shortcuts. Don't take shortcuts because this process, I actually had it done in probably somewhere between four and eight hours, start to finish, except that I screwed up along the way. I actually had it right, um, but I took shortcuts when I did things. Um, like one example, when I read the key data, rather than reading the, the key data and, and using the, the, the pointers that were provided, I just hard-coded the address because I knew the address wasn't changing. Um, so I knew because it was the, the key manager class was actually what's called a singleton method. This is an old version of Linux. It doesn't use uh, something called address space layout randomization. It was always allocated in the same memory address. So I'm like, ah, I'm just going to shortcut this thing. And, and I, I hard-coded a memory address, and, nothing, and it wasn't working. Um, and I spent hours, literally, I think the whole process took like 80 hours to, to, to do what actually I had done correctly in four hours had I not taken shortcuts. One of the shortcuts was, um, that was one of the shortcuts, is I hard-coded the wrong address. So I actually had the code working right, but it was writing data the wrong place, so it seemed like it was working wrong. And then all of these verify your work. Um, remember when I mentioned the key manager check program, which I had at return one? For some reason, um, when I originally wrote the code, rather than doing an inc increment on EAX, which would make the, the value returned one, I did a decrement EAX, which made it negative one, which oddly kind of worked, um, just not correct. So I had weird errors, and that, again, between that and the hard coding the wrong address um, to write the data to, um, I, I think I've spent either between 70 and 74 hours because of those two things. So long story short, don't take shortcuts and always verify your work. So what's next? Uh, make a chi generator program. I actually did that. Um, I figured out how the key is encrypted and I can decrypt keys and I can actually encrypt keys um, given a serial number. Um, I don't believe I'm going to share that but um, I just did that for fun. Uh, I do want to hack the next version of hardware, which I basically did. I haven't tested it yet. Uh, the code is actually easier. They got rid of the whole um, trying to obfuscate the game code with um, that uh, unpacking the game code attempt to start. They, they don't even do that anymore in, in the IN 2014. Um, but at this time, I did not have a fully working system, so I was doing it just um, prototyping it, but I don't have a system to run it on. I do now. Um, but that said, as I mentioned in the first method, I am not until Merit officially is no longer selling keys for this at all, um, or, Mer or am I? I'm not touching that. I'm not. I'm not releasing any information on that. Um, I would like to make the USB I/O board unnecessary because even if, you know, even though I have this done, um, if my USB I/O board breaks, which is that that security dongle, even though I don't need the key anymore, if that breaks, the system's not going to work because there's a whole lot of calls that use it. Now, I think I can easily do this um, because I think I can just replace this with a, a file backend by intercepting things. But I probably will never do that because um, I really have no interest in doing that right now. I did what I wanted to do. I hacked it. So in case, unless my, my machine breaks, the I.O. board breaks and I can't get another one, I probably won't do that. But I have a couple I.O. boards, so I don't think I will ever do so someone else can do that. Um, so if any more information, um, you can go to megatouch.arcadecabinets.com. Um, I call this the Megatouch Longevity Project, Longevity Project, where I'm hosting the um, software, the original system software. I'm not giving out hacked images. Um, the, the, the software that Merit publicly um, put on their website, their support website before they shut down, available to anyone. Um, since you no longer can get it, if your system you need to reinstall it or anything, I have the manuals and I have this information up there um, on the website. So, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And hopefully this will help you keep your Mega Touch alive. See you next time.